Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where today's class is for the birds, and I mean that in a good way. Yes, it's for you. You're going to learn all kinds of incredible things from our friends at the World Center for Birds of Prey, but you're also going to learn how you can help birds and why it's so important. You take these majestic, fast, incredible animals, which you're going to meet in just a few minutes here. Why is it important that we help them? How can we do it? And what are some of the great stories of animal conservation? We've got our friends from the World Center for Birds of Prey. We've got Tate on screen here. Curtis is going to be joining us with some special guests here in just a little bit to tell us all about saving raptors and how you can help do all that. Now, a couple quick things before we get started. We want to make this highly communicative. I've been uh, told that there may even be some bird sounds and bird calls in the works at the end if you ask questions about them. There's a chat box to the right of the screen. Uh, Tay's going to ask you some questions to get us started to find out what you know and want to know about these birds. And if you have any questions whatsoever, fire those into the chat box and we'll get as many of them answered toward the end of class as possible. So uh, I know you're excited to meet our special guest. So let me turn it over to the first one, uh, your first teacher for today, Tate at the World Center for Birds of Prey. Hey, thanks so much, Brian, and thanks to Varsity Tutors for having us. So excited to be here uh, to really share our passion about birds and about birds of prey in particular. And um, first of all, though, I got to back it up. What is a bird of prey? Let me share my screen here. Uh, Curtis and I, we come from a place called the World Center for Birds of Prey, which is the headquarters of the Peregrine Fund. We're a nonprofit organization, and our mission is the global conservation of raptors. Every single bird of prey on planet Earth falls within our mission of uh, conserving them. And so, first of all, I want to make sure that everybody knows what a raptor is. <clears throat> So I got three birds up on the screen here, and I want you guys to tell me which one is a raptor. Let's see if you remember from our last, uh, our last program, which is a couple months ago, A, B, or C, which one is a bird of prey? Remember, I used that word bird of prey and raptor synonymously to mean the same thing. Oh, yeah, I think most of you guys are hitting B there. That's right. Put it in the chat. Go ahead. Just put it in the chat. B is correct. B is a falcon. That's a falcon. The wood duck is not a raptor and nor is the northern cardinal, but that is a lanner falcon there from Africa. So birds of prey are called raptors and they're predatory birds, birds that eat meat. They're carnivores and they have three common traits. They all have hooked beaks. They have excellent eyesight and they have sharp talons. They capture their prey with their feet. And so that's what birds of prey are. And there's 559, more or less, 559 species of birds of prey on planet Earth. There are the owls. Of course, owls are my favorite. There's the falcons. There are the hawks the eagles, the vultures, the kites, and there's a few other ones as well, like the secretary bird, the sariyama, the osprey, which kind of fall into their own family. But these are the kind of the six major categories that most birds of prey fall into. Now, I want to talk a little bit about conservation status. Have you guys heard of conservation status? Every bird, every animal, every plant on planet Earth has a conservation status. It's kind of like, how's it doing? Is it, is it healthy out there on the landscape? Are there not very many of them? Um, you'll recognize some of these words and some of them you might not recognize. So a species that's doing really well would be a species of least concern. Um, look out your window. Whatever bird you see there is probably a species of least concern. You might see a house sparrow, you might see a robin, uh, you might see a, a, a crow or, or even a raven. And so uh, those birds are considered to be least concerned. And then as their population gets smaller, they might be listed as near threatened. There may be, we gotta be concerned about them. And then there is vulnerable, then endangered. Have you guys heard of endangered, like an endangered species? Uh, I think that's one that we're maybe a little bit more familiar with is endangered. 
And even worse than endangered, when there's fewer than endangered, they become critically endangered. Now these have legal definitions. The legal definition of endangered is that if something is not done, if something isn't changed, then that bird will go extinct. And so first they, a bird or an animal or something could become extinct in the wild. Now that is, um, for example, if the bird only exists in a zoo or in a, some sort of animal sanctuary, but they're gone from the wild and, and that is uh, called extinct in the wild. And then extinct is kind of the, the finality of, um, <clears throat> Of when a when a species no longer exists on planet Earth, can you think of any species that are extinct out there? Go ahead and and write an extinct species into the chat box. Yep, you know the dodo bird. The dodo bird is extinct. Yep. Yeah, the passenger pigeon. Very good one. Dinosaurs. I'm seeing dinosaurs. The Velociraptor. Yep, dinosaurs are are extinct. Um, yeah, so th there are a number of birds that have gone extinct, but in North America, there was somebody that really brought to light what it means, what it might mean to lose birds. And back in 1962, somebody named Rachel Carson, she was a biologist, and she wrote a book called Silent Spring. And it had to do with all of the chemicals that people were using, the poisons, the toxins, that we were using on something that I kind of like to call the war on bugs. It, it seemed like in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was a great effort to control insects using toxins, poisons. And uh, she, Rachel Carson, wrote a very eloquent book about what it would be like if we didn't have bird song in the spring, if we didn't have birds controlling the insect populations because that's what the birds eat the insects. So if we poison the insects and then it poisons the birds, bad news. That's what Rachel Carson wrote about. And then that sort of, um, in, a, in kind of a direct way, I'd say, led to the, everybody or a lot of people researching DDT and the ill effects that this bug spray, this poison had on birds and DDT was banned in 1972. And as a result, birds like the peregrine falcon recovered. And so there were a number of birds that became endangered because of DDT. And now if you look at the conservation status of the peregrine falcon, you will find that it is a species of least concern. Although I'm concerned about it very much. I love peregrine falcons, but I'm happy to have them with that conservation status. <clears throat> now, another common bird, at least around Western North America, is the American kestrel. This bird has been declining, although it's still a species of least concern. Take a look at what that bird is eating there. Can you see that? What does that look like there? Grasshopper, maybe a big cricket? Now, birds, as I said, eat insects. And so for us to have healthy bird populations, you gotta have healthy insect populations. And so that's one of the, <clears throat> one of the take home messages from today is in order to conserve birds, we've gotta, con we gotta conserve bugs. We gotta conserve the insects. How can we do that? I wanna introduce you now to my friend, Curtis Evans, and he has got a bird that some people even call a grasshopper hawk. Let's check that out. Hey, everybody, how's it going? This is my friend, Griffin, and she is a Swainson's hawk, but and also known as a grasshopper hawk. And uh, I think my favorite um, nickname for this bird is farmer's best friend. Um, farmers usually don't like it when insects are eating their crops or when little um, rodents are eating their stored food. And so it turns out this bird eats both of those. And uh, mostly they love grasshoppers. You'll find these guys in North America during the, the growing season when there's a lot of bugs around. Um, and sometimes when we, um, 
we talk about habitat loss when humans come into an area, a new place, we develop um, our own habitat. Sometimes it pushes animals out, but with Swainson's hawks, we make a great habitat for them because when we grow our own food, we attract bugs and we attract rodents. And that is what she loves to eat. You might be surprised a bird this big would eat so many bugs. Um, you may be familiar with a very similar hawk called a red-tailed hawk. Um, they look a lot the same, but a red-tailed hawk probably doesn't eat too many um, insects. Um, they're going to have bigger feet and they're going to eat a bigger kind of prey. And our Swainson's hawk has little teeny feet. They're super cute. <laughs> She's looking down at them. Um, and so during the summertime, they're going to snack on a lot of grasshoppers. Um, but you, you might be familiar that here in North America, it gets cold in the winter time, and there are not any grasshoppers jumping around. And our farms kind of go to rest uh, during the winter, and uh, these guys know that's coming, and they head south for the winter. And these birds don't just fly a little bit south, they fly all the way to Argentina. Uh, which is super impressive, uh, quite a migration, um, about 6,000 miles one way to get to their um, winter grounds. And it turns out on the other side of the planet in the Southern hemisphere, it's warm and it's their growing season. And people there are attracting a lot of bugs to their farms as they are um, growing food for people. And so Swainson's hawks are friends of the farmers in both North America and in South America. And um, they do come back when it gets cold in South America, they come back to North America to um, eat those grasshoppers, but they also come up here to raise their young. Um, North America is a great place in the summertime to raise kids. And so Swainson's hawks come here, um, a lot of uh, Western United States and have their kids here. Now they can't really feed their kids grasshoppers and help them grow up because grasshoppers are so tiny and those little kids need a lot of food. And so these talons are really good for grabbing what we have around here called ground squirrels or other rodents that are attracted to our farms. And so they can um, go uh, grocery shopping for the kids. They go hunting and grab some bigger prey and carry it home for their kids. Um, but then when they're out and about and when their kids learn to hunt, they're all practicing and snacking on grasshoppers. They are amazing, amazing birds. Um, my, my favorite thing about Swainson's hawks are that they cross so many boundaries, those uh, countries. They fly all the way from the United States, down through Mexico, through Central America, all the way down into Argentina. And uh, they don't know that they're in different countries. They don't know that the people there speak different languages. They just are going there as they've done for thousands of years to go get their food. And um, I have a lot of stories from my family about those times we went camping and uh, we saw this bird do something amazing. And I'm curious if you guys have seen any birds that you talk about with your family. Go ahead and put some of those in the chat. I'd be curious where and when you have seen birds that are part of your family's stories. I'll give you a second. Yeah, hiking, fishing. Oh, you guys seen eagles catching fish? Yeah, like bald eagles, that's great. Um, some in your backyards? Yeah. I have stories like that in my family where out with my grandpa and he told me what kind of bird that was and what it was doing. And we still remember those moments. And my favorite thing about this bird is that she, we have stories like that here in uh, where I'm from, but these birds can migrate over a lot of different people's homes. And so people in Central and South America also have these experiences with their birds, but it's very likely that those stories contain the same bird. That same bird, the Swainson's hawk, is part of these shared stories among people that I've never met who speak different languages. Um, and they are having those family stories connecting to a Swainson's hawk. It could very well be the same Swainson's hawk that my grandfather showed me while we were hiking. And so that's something I really love about these uh, Swainson's hawks is they connect humanity. And that really came together in the 90s when people in Idaho realized 
our Swainson socks weren't coming back from South America and it kind of made us worried. And so we talked to the folks in Argentina and we sent some scientists down there to figure out what was going on. And we really quickly realized a different set of pesticides because they are eating bugs. Those bugs were getting poisoned in Argentina. And we realized there was a problem when they weren't coming back. And so we worked as a team, um, people in Argentina, people in Idaho, we weren't worried about which country we're from or whose bird or what the problem was. We were working together to save these birds because they were connecting our different cultures. And so um, I, I really think Swainson socks are pretty magnificent for that. Excellent bird, huh? Now she's... <laughs> so um, that effort made sure that those birds are least concerned, like Tate had mentioned, their conservation status is least concerned. We noticed by paying attention that their populations were declining, but they never reached a conservation status worse than least concerned because we were working together, making observations and learned from those past experiences when uh, birds did become endangered. And so we were able to avoid that by um, being working together, cooperation and using science. Curtis, you, you use that word there, observation. And, and I want to talk a little bit about how we use science to save birds of prey. So thank you Let's so much, it. Griffin. Thank you, Curtis. We're going to see you back here just shortly um, with another raptor. All right. We'll see you guys later. So that was a Swainson's hawk. Swainson's hawks are a fairly common hawk of Western North America. So if you're out West, especially in the open country, you probably have Swainson's hawks in the spring and the summertime. But if you're back East, you probably don't have Swainson's hawks. <clears throat> so we use science to save birds of prey. What is science? And, you know, I, I was teaching college science one time. I was teaching uh, biology labs in when I was a graduate student. And I brought up that question, what is science? And I was surprised at how many people could not define what science was. So I want to go through that process here with you guys here to make sure that you guys know what science is. And that way we can figure out how to use it to save birds of prey. So science, there's a method to it. It starts with an observation. And the people that are the best scientists, they really notice things. So what do you observe on your screen right now? Go ahead, write it in the chat box. You observe nothing? Screen is blank? Yes, the screen is blank. Great observation. Why is the screen blank? That's a question that comes from the observation. And in science, after you notice something, you ask a question. Those are the first two, and I would say the most important steps of science are noticing things and asking questions. Oftentimes that question could just be why. So then you come up with an answer to that question. And those answers are called hypotheses. And so Tate doesn't know what he's doing. That's, that could be one of, that could be the, the, the explanation for why the screen was blank. The computer could be frozen. Maybe, maybe, the compu maybe my computer is not working. Um, maybe Zoom is not working. We are using the Zoom platform. Maybe that's not working. Well, let me do a quick experiment here. Now I am going back and forth on my computer and you should see those words coming and going. So I just did an experiment, which showed me that the computer is working and Zoom is working okay. So we can do these little things that they're called experiments to, to figure out which, which of these hypotheses are supported. Maybe it's something else. So in review, we've got the observation, the screen was blank, question, why is the screen blank? And then we come up, as scientists, we come up with different explanations. They're called alternative hypotheses. And there's four different hypotheses here. And really, that fourth one is supported something else. Tate used a blank slide to show us what science is. That is, um, that's the hypothesis that is supported by the data. So that's the foundation of science there. 
And that's what we use to save birds of prey. We ask questions, uh, we make observations, ask questions, come up with explanations, and then we test those hypotheses to figure out which hypothesis is supported. <clears throat> now, I'm myself and Curtis, we're at the World Center for Birds of Prey. So let me bring you into the World Center for Birds of Prey here. <clears throat> so we're just south of Boise, Idaho. We've got a 580-acre campus and we house some of the leading raptor biologists and scientists and educators in the world. And this is where I am in this building here. This is where we have an interpretive center where we teach people about birds. There's a school bus here. So oftentimes there's students here. There were students here today. And then back here, there are all of these breeding barns where we raise endangered raptors, birds that we think would not otherwise recover unless they were hatched and raised in captivity. <clears throat> now, one of those birds that we're raising here is the California condor. Have you ever seen a condor? Now, the condor is North America's largest bird. A bald eagle has about a six foot wingspan, whereas a condor's wingspan is nine and a half feet. These guys can weigh twice what a bald eagle weighs. It's the largest flying land bird in North America. Looks like most of you have not seen a condor. Well, you might get the opportunity because the condor populations are growing. Oh yeah, there's somebody that's seen a condor down there in Southern California. Yeah, they are in California. <clears throat> so in 1985, there were only 22 of these birds left in the world. They were critically endangered. And then by 1987, they were extinct in the wild, meaning they were only existed in captivity. <clears throat> Removed from the wild by 1987, and captive breeding saved the species. Now here's a range map. This is where you can find condors out there. We've got the stars are the release sites. Now the Peregrine Fund releases birds at the Vermilion Cliffs, which is just north of the Grand Canyon. And those birds are in Southern Utah and Northern Arizona primarily. There's a small population in Mexico, and then there's also a population in, in uh, Central and Southern California. Now, there's also a new population in the Redwoods because the Yurok tribe, in conjunction with their partners, have released condors into Redwood National Park, which is in Northern California. So the condor is endangered, but why is it endangered? And these data here, I'm gonna challenge you guys to read this graph. Along the bottom of the graph, this is called the x-axis, there are the months of the year, January and February, March, April, May, June, and then all the way out to November and December. Now, the, on the y-axis is the percentage of condors exposed to lead. Now, lead is a neurotoxin. And it turns out that our hypothesis was that lead poisoning was affecting condors. And so we tested that by collecting these data. And the higher the bar, the more lead poisoning there is. And the bigger the, the red bar, that's the lead poisoning. Now, the yellow part of the bar is lead exposure. So there's lead in their system, but maybe not at such a critical level as the red. <clears throat> so what we noticed here is that there's a seasonality to the lead poisoning. And this was a key piece of data for us to figure out how to save condors. First of all, we need to know what's killing them, right? And so November, December, and January and February, that's the most. That happens to coincide with the with hunting season and the, and really the end of hunting season. And so that we know that the con condors are scavenging on dead animals, and oftentimes they're scavenging on parts of dead animals that are left in the field, like gut piles and stuff like that. So we looked at deer that had been that had been harvested through hunting, and we X-rayed those deers or those deer 
And then we found lead fragments inside of the animals that had been shot. It turns out that much more than people thought that lead bullets are soft enough that they would fragment into the animal. And those fragments are what we were finding in the bellies of dead condors. Here's another um, radiograph here, or an x-ray of, uh, of a deer that's shot through the neck. And you can see these, these little white dots here are lead. And when the scavenger comes along and eats that carcass, they can consume that lead. <clears throat> so by 1987, there were only 22 condors in the world. Now, as of today, the last I heard, I asked Curtis and he told me there were now 561 birds. So they are maybe off the precipice. They are not just about to go extinct, but 561 is not a very big population for condors. <clears throat> and we have determined through science, through experimenting, that lead poisoning is the problem. So what do we do about that? You know, condors have been following people around, in particular Native Americans, for over 14,000 years and eating the remains of dead animals that people leave behind. It turns out that people are pretty efficient at killing other animals for food and condors and other vultures that are scavengers, they come along and clean up the landscape. They come along and eat the pieces of those dead animals that we leave behind. So we don't think that hunting is the problem. In fact, we think that hunting is the answer. So we have formed the North American Non-Lead Partnership, which is a whole bunch of hunting groups that have got together and said, I think we as hunters can take care of this problem. That's the North American Non-Lead Partnership. And all sorts of entities have jumped on in order to help condors and to help other scavenging wildlife be healthier out on the landscape. And that is going to involve a reduction of some of that poison that's out there. I'm going to switch gears now, talk a little bit about owls, because owls are my favorite creatures on planet Earth. I got my graduate degree studying owls, and we are going to delve a little bit into my graduate research. Now, this is a timeline here. So we've got present day all the way on the right, and we're going to go back millions of years all the way back to the first bird in the fossil record. That's 150 million years ago. And that's a, that's a bird called Archaeopteryx. They call that the missing link or the found link anyway, the link between the dinosaurs and the birds. <clears throat> now the first owl or the oldest owl fossil on planet earth was 58 million years old. So owls have been on planet Earth for about 58 million years. I have a hard time even fathoming how long that is. In that time, they've habituated, most of them have habituated to the night environment. And they use that low light and they, they rely on their vision. <clears throat> but oftentimes their vision is they can't use their vision if there's no light at all. If there's sun, a moonlight, starlight, or some sort of light, they can use their vision. But owls have evolved some of the most sensitive hearing in the bird world. Now, I got my graduate degree studying the northern Sawet owl, which is the cutest owl, I think, of all the owls in the whole world. And it's just a little owl. It's just about this big. And... It has the highest degree of ear asymmetry. Now, owls, not all owls, but a lot of owls have one ear that opens up higher in the head than the other. And that's what you see in this video or in this uh, picture here. So that's the northern Sawet owl skull. Notice one ear is, is down and pointed down and one ear is up and kind of pointed up. That allows the bird to have very, very precise sound localization. And that helps them to be able to hunt. <clears throat> now, within the last 100 years or so, 
there has been an increase in noise across planet Earth. And a lot of that is what I call industrial noise, factories and that sort of thing. And in particular, uh, energy extraction and gas compressor stations that run 24 hours a day. And oftentimes these compressor stations are out in prime owl habitat. They like to keep them away from people because they can be too noisy and they would be very annoying for people. But that led me to a question. Well, let me back up. Observation, the world is getting louder. My question, are owls impacted by noise? Can owls hunt by hearing? as they've been doing for the last 58 million years when there's noise on the landscape. <clears throat> My hypothesis is that owls can't use hearing to hunt in noise. Now, I could just say that, and, and you, you all might believe me that that's the thing, but unless I have some data to back that up, unless I can actually run an experiment, um, then it, it's just a hypothesis. So let's see if that hypothesis was supported. I went out for three years and I built this giant tent. This is a flight tent here. And out in these woods, I would trap owls and I would bring them into this flight tent in order to essentially ask them a question. Can you hunt while I play this background noise at different levels? And while the experiment was going on, I had this little tent, that was my control booth, where I was running the different noise treatments and stuff like that. So here's the experiment. Now inside the tent, this is, the, this is a, a, a view of the tent. So the door of the tent is at the top, and that is my flight tent. In the tent, I built a perch that the owls would sit on. And then I built a runway for the mouse. Now the mouse would be on this runway <clears throat> and having a runway in this shape helped me control the distance of the owl to the mouse. It was always about two and a half meters. Now I used speakers to change the noise level. I filmed everything. So I was not in this tent while the experiment was happening. I filmed everything. And not only did I film it, but I filmed it in the dark using infrared light. Owls cannot see into the infrared spectrum. Uh, neither can humans, by the way. And so by lighting this room with infrared and using infrared sensitive, sensitive cameras, I was able to film what was going on in the complete absence of light. Now, I didn't go in there while the experiment was going on. So I used these, um, these tubes in order to introduce a mouse to the experiment. And then there's one of the Sawet owls that I trapped out into the wild and put into this tent to see if the owl could hunt during the noise. So this is what, this is a live video, um, or it's not live, I guess, but this is a, a recorded video. There's the owl up on the perch. Here is the mouse runway. And there's going to be a little mouse that shows up right down out of this, um, of this mouse delivery device. And this is no noise going on. <clears throat> Mouse has shown up. Owl keys in right away. Now it's important to note that that owl was able to hunt in the complete absence of light using its phenomenal hearing and sound localization ability. Now, I use different intensities of noise, and here is an owl hunting in the noise. Now, this mouse has already been out here walking around for quite a while. And with the noise playing in the background, the owl just was not able to key in on where the, mice were, where the mouse was. Well, one thing you might conclude from my research is that noise is good for owls. No, noise is good for mice, is what I meant to say. Um, and, and maybe it is. There's some research that's coming out that's showing that in areas of high noise levels, 
you're seeing more rodents. That could be because there's less owls that are able to, su to successfully hunt in that area. <clears throat> so after you do an experiment, the way to share that those data, the way the way to share the research is to publish the paper in a peer-reviewed journal. So experts from around the world looked at my study and they determined that it was statistically valid, that it, that the set that the study made sense, and then it was published. And a lot of people have read this this paper, and we are able to make decisions about how much noise we put out in the environment based on our understanding of the effect of noise on owls. I think it's time to meet an owl. Let me shoot it back over to Curtis and we can meet one of the most fascinating owls on planet Earth. Oh, this is my friend Oliver and he is a Verose eagle owl or if you want to look it up and spell it a little easier, you could look up a milky eagle owl. And um, he was watching that presentation, and I think he was very interested in learning about owls, especially when that timeline came up. He was quite interested in learning about owls. Um, and I do think those saw what owls are pretty cute, and so did he. Um, but this is a quite bigger owl. In fact, this owl is from Africa, an African species. And it's the largest owl in Africa, the milky eagle owl. And Oliver here, he just turned five years old. And um, now some of you might be five years old or maybe just a little bit older than five, maybe quite a bit older, maybe 10, 12. But you guys are still kids, right? Students and children. But Oliver, he's all grown up. He was a grown up at about two years old. Owls grow up very quickly. And so he is full grown. In fact, he was actually full grown. His body was full grown at about a month and a half old. Um, and then he kind of was a teenager for a year or so. And he's, a, he's all grown up and he's got some very impressive feathers. And there's, they stick up on the top of his head. Now, sometimes we call those ears. You might've heard of owls that have ears like a long eared owl or the short eared owl and they're talking about those feathers on top of his head and uh i don't think those are actually his ears um sometimes we call them horns we even have a great horned owl here in north america referring to those those feathers up top and they're not horns they're not ears and so i think we like to whoop, where's he going you want to stick around yeah Curtis, looks like we maybe lost your video there. Oh, let me put it back on. We are, we're ready to go. Let me see what's up. All right, I'm coming back. <laughs> right, back on. Did all, did yeah. all of them must have taken a little flight there. I know we do lots of flights in that classroom there. Oh, what happened? Well, that's interesting. It's got me a notification, huh? Let me try something a little tricky here and see if this will do the trick. This is our flight room. Can you see us all right right here? No, uh, Curtis, we, we can't see you. Oh, it's the wrong camera then. Okay, well, let me try the other one then and see if you can, if it'll stick around long enough. Can you see me now? Not quite oh, yet. Oh, um, okay, it's Zoom. Let me. They're huh? watching the owl take flight was that um, we... just one in many no, there's, there's, there's your camera right now we got gotcha. you all right how about this camera can you see me right here yeah perfect that that camera might last a little longer before timing out so um we're talking about those goofy feathers on top right and that's all they are they're just kind of not really attached to their ears and they're oh, not no, we lost you again curtis say what we lost it we lost your camera feed Again, oh my goodness, well, this is going to be. Well, also nocturnal. He's, he's, he's trying to do what he can to get uh, get his habitat right. Oh, we <laughs> got you. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's not staying on for us there. 
Yeah, I keep pushing that button and it times out. Um, well, let's get a quick look at Oliver while we can. Those are just feather, woof, feather tufts. That's the name of those feathers, are feather tufts. I'm going to try out something a little, a little uh, right here. Let's see. All right. Well, you tell me when that camera goes out, and I'll just click this button, and you'll see them. So while you're all right, all Curtis, right, I think we got to abandon that camera. It doesn't seem to be working. It's us. not working. Well, oh my goodness, this is. <laughs> well, you guys have been asking some great questions. Maybe while uh, while Curtis plays with the camera, um, Tate, if we can get a couple questions your way, and that'll uh, it's, I, it's, yeah, let's do it. Anything if people are watching, everybody's watching you. It's hard to uh, you know to, to test any of those kind of things. So our hypothesis is it was that camera. We're gonna let uh, Curtis test that. And then, Tate, people have been asking some questions. We get we get a lot about, uh, you know, you think you mentioned that the condor is the biggest bird in uh, North America. Do you know what's the biggest raptor of all and how big is that maybe in comparison to the condor? And how small do raptors get? And, and do we just see that? Okay, yeah, the, the biggest raptor of all. Um, I, I don't rightly know. Um, I'd have to I'd have to go consult um, Google on that one. Um, I'd say one of the biggest is the Andean condor. I know that guy's a little bit bigger than the California condor. Um, there's a number of very, very large uh, vultures in Africa, and I wouldn't be surprised if one of those is larger than the, than the Andean condor, but I'm not positive on that. Um, I think the smallest raptor is a falconet, um, a very, very small falcon. There's also an elf owl that is the, the smallest, I believe the smallest raptor in North America. Um, the elf owl is, is less than four ounces. That's really amazing to think of. You think of raptors as the big wingspan and, and all those. Although I think you've told us before, even the biggest raptors don't weigh very much, right? Is that, do we have a, yeah, a feel yeah, for? Yeah, correct. Yeah. And also size doesn't have really much to do with their, with the, with them being a raptor. It's more about having those characteristics and being a predator. Of course, it, you know, the characteristics being the hook beak, the excellent eyesight, the sharp talons, capturing prey with the feet. And if, you know, oftentimes those birds are larger, but some of the, sometimes birds that are very small have become successful in that as well. Oftentimes they might be insect eaters, but you know, like the flammulated or the elf owl, those guys are eating bugs. Awesome. Thank you. That's um, yeah, we get a lot of, a lot of size questions and, and that kind of thing, obviously, especially once you see them up close like that and get a, you know, a, a feel for how big or small they can be and all those kind of things. Some for you, that's, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one. People are blown away by, you know, the, the setup of that experiment, the, uh, the length of time that it took. Um, how did you decide you wanted to study owls? And, um, and then, you know, where, if other people are just as fascinated, like, Hey, I can study owls for a living. Uh, what's your advice to people who are realizing sure. that's something they want to do? You know, in my in my trajectory to becoming an owl biologist, I first got into just birds in general, and in particular songbirds. And I started volunteering with. It turned out I was one of my cousins, and he had been working on a PhD project as I finished my biology degree at Western Washington University up in Bellingham. And I was just fresh out of college. And he said that if we go and work in this remote place, it was actually in Hawaii. And then I, I could stay in this cabin and he couldn't pay me very much, but he could cover my food. And he got me a nice pair of binoculars. And we went out and studied birds for over a year. And I was just immersed in, in songbirds in particular, little perching birds. And so I got into that. And then that kind of spun off into my first paid job studying birds as a biologist. And then I actually kind of stumbled into owls because I was living down on the Oregon coast and I was looking for a job in biology with a background having studied birds. And there's a bird down in Southern Oregon called the Northern Spotted Owl. And that is a bird that is listed as a threatened species. Some might even think it is endangered. Um, it's it's still listed as threatened, but it is near endangered. And there were there were jobs 
studying the spotted owl. So that's how I started studying owls. And then I went to graduate school to really learn how to conduct an experiment like that. That's to me what grad school was all about. And it could have been about owls or it could have been using some other, you know, that like other people in my lab were studying the same thing, the same question, but with bats instead of owls. And so, you know, I could have been working with bats, but of course, being a bird guy, owls was it for me. Well, that's very cool. And as an owl expert, uh, one of the questions we get a lot, and I think we started to see some evidence of it before Oliver took off. Can owls really turn their head all the way around or about how far can they go? Sure, sure. So, so I'm face forward right now, 90 degrees just to the side, 180 degrees to the back. Owls can turn about 240 degrees. So not quite 270. Um, so that, that's almost three quarters of, of the way around. But now imagine that a bird is three quarters of the way around almost, and then goes back to forward and then back the other way. Now that's when a bird might give the appearance that's just spinning its head, but it cannot do that. Uh, but it can sit on a perch with its body perfectly still where no mice or anything might will, will detect it. And it can look in, and listen in every direction without moving its body, which is a great adaptation for hunting. That is really pretty, pretty incredible. We got a chance to see Oliver get pretty close to that. And uh, Curtis, if you can hear us, hey uh, feel free to interrupt when, uh, when, when the camera and, uh, and Oliver are ready, but uh, we'll continue. Yeah. Do well, a, um, I've changed my, um, I've changed my photo. Yep. Um, and that's about as good as my camera is going to get. So if you want to look at that photo, of, I don't know if you can see that. Um, oh, yeah, my we, camera uh, we can see it. Is not going to work. But I did want to share a little bit about these owls um, and their diet. Um, very similar to our Swainson's hawk, they eat, as Tate demonstrated, a lot of rodents and a lot of insects. And not this owl that, you, that we met does not live near you. Um, unless you are tuning in from Africa. Um, but we have so many owls that live near our homes, near our houses. In fact, I would say they live at our homes, not inside our house, but in our yards, our parks, our libraries, um, out in our fields where we grow our food. Owls have lived around humans for so long and they are so used to eating uh, around us. Um, and one of the things that we can accidentally do is poison our owls. When what we are trying to do, like Tate had mentioned earlier, is control our bugs. We don't really like bugs and mice living near us. And so we have a partner who's been around eating those things for thousands of years. But when we invented some of these poisons, we we're accidentally getting our owls so um, I don't think we're going to be able to see Oliver again with our camera the way it is. Um, but I just wanted to point that out, that our owls, as much as we love seeing Oliver, we have owls that live near us. And so I encourage you to look for those owls and listen for them um, and to help protect them. Um, there are some really simple things we can do to make sure that our owls are healthy um, and that keeps our homes healthy. Our own environments can be more healthy if we have healthy owls. Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you much more with Oliver here. Um, so let's, um, Tate, I don't know if you had any more that you wanted to yeah, share. Curtis, but... Curtis, I do, I do have a, a couple of, a couple of things yep. that, that really, really just kind of wrap up this program. And then we can, of course, keep it open for questions, but how can you help raptors? And when it comes down to it, healthy prey equals healthy raptors. If a bird of prey has healthy food to eat, then their population will be healthy. In fact, that's why the Peregrine Fund and the World Center for Birds of Prey exists, because birds of prey are indicators of the health of the environment. When the environment is healthy, all the who eats who in nature, the food chain is healthy. And um, it, when the food chain is healthy, humans are healthy as well. And so birds of prey, very important to study and very important to keep healthy. Uh, 
So limit the use of poisons for rodents and for bugs. We try to keep poisons out. Um, native plants are very important. So when you look at um, going down the different, you know, we mentioned the word earlier, trophic, uh, trophic levels. Uh, at least Brian and I were talking about that. That's just different levels of the food chain. And as you go to those lower levels of the food chain, you pretty quickly get to the plants. And insects rely on the plants in particular. And there's a lot of animals that rely on the plants as well. But plants that are adapted to your ecosystem, to that have evolved in the same place, you know, maybe where you're living, what I would consider to be a native plant. Um, pursuing native plants creates healthy food chains. And then another thing you could do is you could leave snags. Uh, if you have a dead tree that is not dangerous, that's like not going to fall on somebody, I understand that if there's a dead tree right by your house, you might want to take care of it. But oftentimes, owls and woodpeckers and other birds, they need cavities in trees. They need holes in trees in order to nest. Those holes typically only exist in trees that are dead, or at least often exist when they're dead. And also, lots of bugs are in dead trees, and that creates lots of bird habitat. And then go out and look for birds. Go out and find those owls in your yard. The more that we are all aware of birds and appreciate birds, the easier they are to save. All right, there's another picture of a condor to leave you on. And it looks like Curtis is back. Oh, great. Yeah, let's go full screen to Curtis. We, uh, yeah, we've been we've been waiting on him as we, uh, we end on a high note. So here, let me spotlight you, Curtis, and uh, let's get it like, you know, Tate Excellent. said, let's look for birds. Let's look for birds. There he is. Excellent. Well, I, I know we're short on time, so maybe there's a few questions that you might have um, for Oliver or the things we talked about. Um, and we can see if Oliver can help us answer some of those questions you might have. Absolutely. I think one is, uh, you know, a lot of people were, were pretty excited to hear that owls are all around us. What tips do you guys have? If we want to see owls, we know they, they tend to be nocturnal. Um, what, uh, what can we do to, to better our chances of, of seeing them? If oh, the best way of finding an owl might not be seeing it. Um, it's possible you can see one, but the best thing you're going to be able to do is probably hear one. Find one with your ears, just like an owl finds a mouse you can find an owl with your ears. And the best time of year to listen is just mm. about mm. right now. Mm. Did you guys hear that? Did you guys oh, hear that? Our, our video just cut out again. We're, <laughs> I don't think I can get it back. Um, but I want to answer that question, if you can hear the sound of my voice. Yeah, um, we can hear you, Curtis. Imagine it's pitch dark <laughs> and the camera's not working. And you can listen to owls. What they will do is in the same situation, they can't use their eyes at night so well they will call to each other this time of year to help set up their breeding grounds. They will attract a mate and they'll, they'll talk to each other with their voices and they'll make those calls that you just heard. And when one owl hears that sound, they'll then all repeat it. It's like playing Marco Polo in a swimming pool with your eyes closed. And if you make a call out, you say Marco and everyone else says Polo. And with owls, they just use the same call back and forth. They can tell how many owls are in front of them versus how many owls are behind them. And they'll actually start spreading out and using the different resources in that area. And so if you go outside this time of year, late, late winter, early spring, you will hear those owls playing that game of Marco Polo. And that can get you pretty close to where there might be hunting. Tate, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, for Kurt, Kurt, the only thing I would add is seeing an owl is like serendipity. You just need to be out there in, in areas where there are owls and eventually you'll see one. And it might take a long time, but then all of a sudden there it is. And so just be out there looking. I agree with listening first to find it, but even when you hear them, they can be hard to find. Yeah. Thank you. And like you said, I think we're a little bit over on time. So maybe that's end with this. I know we were talking a little bit before class about, uh, you know, another a grand reopening at the World Center for Birds of Prey. Um, for those who are inspired, um, can can get to Boise, you know, relatively quickly or want to make a summer trip out of it. Um, tell us about what we can find if we want to come and visit you guys, learn a little bit more about raptors and uh, experience the World Center for Birds of Prey. 
Yeah, absolutely. The World Center for Birds of Prey, headquarters of the Peregrine Fund, we're just located in Boise, Idaho, and we have just done a major new expansion. We've built um, a, a new entryway, and we've built um, new exhibits for some of our birds, and we are telling the story of science and conservation. And we also have some educational spaces where we're flying birds all the time. So you come meet birds like Oliver and Griffin. And when we let them go and they take to the sky, that's really the best way to see and experience birds of prey. So I, I, I welcome everybody to come out and visit us here in Boise. Awesome. Well, it was, it was very fun watching Oliver take flight for uh, for just a second, even though that led to some camera issues and all that. But um, Curtis, thanks for checking them down. Tate, thank you for sharing such uh, incredible stories of conservation and uh, and your own uh, you know experimentation and and you know your you know your use of a scientific method with us. For everyone out there, we're going to leave you some information. Let me pop it up right here on uh, how to learn more about the World Center for Birds Prey. Also, how to be able to connect with uh, with Varsity Tutors. All kinds of amazing events coming up. Uh, throughout the spring and summer. So we hope to see you here back soon. I uh, I hope to, I'm going to make a trip to the World Center for Birds of Prey one of these days soon as well. So I hope to see you at there. I know these guys do as well. So thanks to everyone in, uh, in Boise. Thanks to all of you out there and we'll see everybody back here soon.